Awesome, guys, you're here for day four. So before I delve in and let you know who we're sharing with you today, yesterday we had Justina all about the boxes. I learned loads. I don't know about you, Claire. What do you think? What did you learn yesterday? A hundred percent. As I said yesterday, like this isn't a breed I see very often. And just listening to her talking about the breed and how the misconception of them is quite almost clownish and that they're not that and that they have so much capabilities in them. I, I just love the way she explained uh, about the breed itself. It almost made me want one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are such an intelligent breed and it's just awesome to learn even more about them. Like, like you mentioned yesterday, I don't see loads of boxes here either. So it's a fast, fascinating interview. Yeah. But we are on day four. So who are we sharing with you today? So today we have Natasha. We have Natasha today, uh, again, super excited. I've been excited every day, but really excited about this one. Uh, sneak peek, we're talking a lot about play. So let's get started and let's get speaking to Natasha. Enjoy, guys. Today, I'm super excited to speak to Natasha Lewis. Um, so first of all, Natasha, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and also what you do. Okay, so I'm Natasha Lewis and... Um, I'm based down in Dorset, where I run Night Saber Dog Training. Um, and as well as Night Saber Dog Training, I also run the Positive Belgian. So um, let me just tell you about Night Saber Dog Training first, because that is my um, bread and butter. So it's my training club. And I basically offer dog training for, for dogs of all ages. So from property all the way up to adults, and I also offer obedience training, rally obedience, and hoopers. Um, so that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I also run a, another website, which is called the Positive Belgian, and that is all about the Belgian Shepherd breed. So it's about positive training for Belgian Shepherds, because when you, um, when you go in, step into the Belgian Shepherd world, there is this misconception that Belgian Shepherd needs harsh handling um, and they don't need that at all. Um, people think that they're very strong and um, very difficult dogs. But in fact, the reason they're difficult is because they're uber sensitive. And people just don't see that. So I just with the positive Belgian, I'm sort of going to try and, and change people's perception of the Belgian Shepherd dog just so that they get a true understanding about what the breed is all about. Oh, that's super exciting. I'm definitely going to speak to you more about that shortly. Yeah, and what, do, what dogs do you own? <laughs> so, unsurprisingly, I own Belgian Shepherds. Um, there's actually four varieties. So you have got the Taveran, which is probably the most common known breed um, of Belgian Shepherd, apart from the Malinois. The Malinois is the short-haired version and is often used by the military and the police um, as security dogs and protection dogs. Um, the, the Malis are normally um, fawn dogs with a black mask and they've got short hair. The Taverans are the same colouring um, and they go from a, a deep mahogany red all the way to like a blonde colour um, with a black overlay and again, the black face, the black mask, although the mask doesn't go over the eyes. So if it goes over the eyes, it's it's too high. Yeah. Um, and they're long haired. Um, and then you've got mine, which are the Grenandals. Um, they're the long haired blacks. And then you have also got the Lacanois, which is the least well known of the four varieties. And coat wise, Think about the same colouring as the, the Mali, so that's they're, they're sort of the, the red to the to the fawn, um, with again the black mask on them, but they fur-wise they present more like the like a bouvier. Yeah. So it's a harsh, uh, about two inches long the fur is, but it's got like a little bit of a not a curl, but more of a wave in it. Yeah. I think that's the best different. way of describing the coat. So yeah, so there's four there's four varieties in total, and they're all named after the region in Belgium where they originated from. Oh well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, so that's that's where it all comes from. So tell us a bit about your dogs. 
So I have got um, my 10 year old is Sena, um, homebred. She was the one in the litter that, well, when Luna, her mum, gave birth, she did two, she had two contractions really close together and two puppies popped out. And of course she went for one. And then when I lifted up her tail, there was another one there. So Sena is the one that was left under the tail. So she's the one that I actually had to get going when she was yeah. born. Oh, wow. Um, so I, if it hadn't been for me, I don't think she would have survived because she yeah. would have been that left there too long while mom took care of the other puppy. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I got her going and when she was, uh, breathing properly I just popped her on the teeth and then you know mum did the rest after that <laughs> but I just had to get her going and it took quite a bit actually to get her going oh. um so I think she was sort of destined to stay here <laughs> yeah <after that. laughs> um in the end uh, you know I, I had a couple of people when they came looking around um for their puppies in the litter I had a couple of people that were interested in her and at the end of the day, I couldn't let her go. So she stayed. Um, and then Cassie, um, she is my um, six-year-old. I can't believe she's six. Um, she's my six-year-old and she's my problem child. Um, again, she was homebred, um, but because of circumstances, I was left, left with three puppies until they were about 17 weeks old so we missed out on that really early bonding together yeah. because what happened was that because we had three puppies um one went about 12 weeks but the other stayed until he was 17 weeks um i had litter syndrome so basically cassie bonded with her brother rather than bonding with me even though i was doing everything separately with them yeah. they still bonded together and that is, that's one of the big problems that you get when you have two puppies from the same litter, actually. And it doesn't even have to be two puppies from the same litter. If you get two puppies the same age and you try and raise them together, you will always get some degree of um, litter syndrome. Yeah. In my experience, because those puppies are going to be much closer together than they are with you. Yeah. Definitely. And, and that was actually quite quite a difficult thing for me because I've, I've never had that before um <clears throat> so the previous litter I kept a puppy back as well but I hadn't kept one myself so I wasn't sort of trying to create a bond a specific bond with that puppy yeah. um even though with Lewis I did create a very strong bond or theory as I called him when he was with me <laughs> But yeah, that's a that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that one because it's not. I don't think it's relevant to this. Um... <laughs> no worries. Yeah, to this chat. So I want to ask you a few questions. Um, so yeah, what, go ahead. What I want to ask first is, what does engagement mean to you? To me, engagement is your dog wanting to interact with you. Um, so it's creating a strong bond so that your dog sees you as basically the center of his universe. To me, that is what engagement, you know, that's what I want. When I'm looking for engagement for my dog, I want my dog just to be in tune with me and what I want and almost do it because, because it becomes automatic to do what I want them to do. And yeah. that is, yeah, to me, that is what, good engagement is all about it's not about the dog not being a dog it's about the dog wanting to stay with me versus wanting to go off after the birds or going to chase the rabbits or or anything like that to yeah. me it's the dog wanting to work for me yeah because we often do hear that don't we my dog will listen at home but it ignores me on walks my dog listens at home but as soon as he's or I listen on walks but as soon as it sees another dog it doesn't listen yeah and that is you know and that is you know the the big solution to that is to get engagement from your dog to you and it's not easy to do no. you know most people really struggle with this and I do think it's surprising that people struggle with engagement so much because you know it's hard to compete 
for your dog's attention with everything else that's going around in the world. And if you're not interesting enough, you're not going to get that from your puppy. So it is finding that balance between going completely over the top and having a dog that's as high as a kite. And being interesting enough that your dog doesn't want to go and go away from you to have more fun somewhere else. Yeah, definitely. And so that takes you nicely into <laughs> you're known for your fun, focus and play method that you yeah. have with the. So what sort of things do you do in your fun, focus? Tell me a little about each element of this. And I okay. imagine there's bits of engagement and going through all of this. <laughs> yes, there it is. And there's actually a lot of engagement going through the whole the whole philosophy behind my fun focus play process um because first of all training should be fun for you and your dog so that's where the fun bit comes from okay but a focus itself can be you know getting focus from your dog can be really really boring right so we're looking at fun ways of getting that focus so the fun actually has two elements to it it's it's the fact that you're enjoying the company of your dog and training your dog and interacting with your dog and that your dog enjoys being with you but also that while you're doing that your dog actually learns to focus on you um so that's the fun focus bit and the play bit i think is really self-explanatory right because one of the biggest things that i do with with my training method is i teach people how to play with their dog to get that engagement from them and because you're playing with your dog you're having fun your dog is having fun and you can also use that play as a reward so you don't have to rely on the treats all the time yeah and yeah that's definitely. what the whole program is all about so just for our listeners and viewers explain a little bit about what you mean by get them to play because quite often they'll get a toy you'll go play play with your dog and they'll grab a toy and they'll go here you go play with this they will literally do that won't they they will yes <laughs> Or they will get a toy and they just chuck it. Yeah. So and what's neither you, of those? It's neither of those. Watch. <laughs> Explain to them then what you mean by play with your dog. So okay. Go so away from this call with so, things to have a go at. Yeah. Okay. So play. When I say play with your dog, and when I'm talking about play in in the way I do play, is that all the play that we do is me playing with my dog. So it's really interactive and I'm constantly, um, what's the best way? Bear with me a second. I'll just grab a toy. Yeah, it's always easier. With you. Toy, yeah. It's always <laughs> easier with a toy in your hand to try and explain it. No just bear with me a second. I should just pop in to get a toy, guys. Just to let you all know, we have got dogs in the room, and some of you know that I have got a young puppy. Okay, this morning doesn't want to sleep, so if she wakes up, you might all get to meet her. <laughs> She's just settled at last next to me. And Sasha's going to go through with you how to do some playing. She's going to show you some examples of what that. she's got as well, which is awesome. I'm back with toys, <laughs> with toys. Okay, so the simplest way to get interactive play with your dog is by using little tuggy or one of these little roadkill toy. No stuffing in that flat and it has got a little... <laughs> that way the dog's up. <laughs> in there, yeah. Okay, so when i'm playing with with the toys now you should see cassie and you can't unfortunately but if you could see cassie she's yeah. now staring at me because i've got a toy in my hand okay and that's what you want you want them to say oh wow we're gonna play now so basically what you do is when you have a toy so something like this or something like that what you do is you make it so if your dog is in front of you you don't throw it in your dog's face, right? Because that'll put anyone off. You know, when you go and play with your kids, the first thing that you're going to do is not throw the toy right at their face. <laughs> so why are we doing it to our dogs? I have got a clue, but it doesn't work. Your dog has got to go, whoa, don't want that. 
<laughs> but you see it do we do see it often don't we play with me play um, with me i've got this i've got this thing yes and you, the other thing that you don't do is sort of pop it in front of their face and go like god play with this play with this play with this again it, it puts the dogs off right so what you do instead is between if the dog is here and you're over here wanting him to play with this toy rather than pushing it in his face what you're going to do is you're going to chuck it on the floor and wriggle it okay so you're going to wriggle it make it seem like it's like a little snake and it's come alive right <laughs> and then the puppet's going to go and as you just do that you move it across their field of vision right when you do that your puppet's going to go oh, what's that Ooh, oh, i want to grab that and then before you know it your puppy goes oh. <laughs> and then you can play tug right you can just and if you've got a puppy very gentle playing tug okay and when i say play tug i don't mean that's not playing tug playing tug is about just maintaining that tension and basically as your dog has got hold of the toy you're just basically moving it from side to side as your puppy and your pup might be doing that but you're not doing that back Okay, so you're just moving it, keeping that tension, just moving it from side to side. And as your puppy is pulling it, okay, that really creates a really nice, gentle tug to play with your puppy with. Okay, so that is using a tuggy. And as you can see, the tuggy that I use is quite a long one. Okay, and the reason I use quite a long tuggy is because the chances are that my dog is then not going to grab my hand if you're using a tug that size and your dog keeps grabbing your hands then the best thing to do is as soon as your dog grabs your hand you just let go and stop the play let your dog calm down a little bit and then try again if he keeps doing it if you get something like this right which again your puppy will absolutely love and they'll want to have that in their mouth. Um, what you can do is if you then have got, so this is something on my design because what I've done is I've taken an extra long tuggy <laughs> and I've split the end on it so that I can then <laughs> strangle the roadkill. <laughs> strangle the roadkill, yeah. So what I then do is I tie that onto the end so I tie a different toy. So my dog's favorite toy goes on the end of this. Yeah. And then I can do the same thing. So actually it can, it can turn any toy like this into a tuggy and chase toy. Oh, brilliant. So <laughs> it's really, it's really a good, good thing of doing it. And then you've got a much longer handle to keep your hand out of the way. So your hand can be a slightly higher up. So it's no longer in your dog's reach. And then you can do the same with this. So you can just make it, make it come alive as you're trying to, it's difficult to do it when you're not doing it on the ground. And also when you keep, when you're doing this type of play, keep it low down because you don't want to encourage your dog to jump up and grab. Yeah, yeah. Which you often quite see is people doing this with the toys. They're, they're like, doing it up there. Yeah. They're doing it up there. And you don't want to do it up there. It needs to be on the floor. Yeah. That was a really. And then, I liked your description, Sasha. That was really good because it's hard to do on these sort of computer screens and stuff, isn't it? When we've not. Got yeah, and this is this well. is why it's so much easier if you actually show some toys. But you know, with these toys, you can tie anything at the end of it. Yeah. You know, so you've got a toy like this, and your puppy keeps going for your for the handle rather than for the ball at the end or for the the fluffy bit. Just tie one of these to it. Yeah, it just, it just keeps those hands away from those puppies, those sharp. Yeah, sharp and you know, when you don't you don't even have to make these like I have done. You know, you can just get a longer fleecy toy, just undo the ends a little bit, you know, just undo the, the knot at the end, tie it around a toy, and you've got an extra long tuggy toy. Yeah, quite often it keeps your hands safe. Toys a little bit too small, don't they, with the puppies? You get, you get a puppy yeah, yeah, toy, actually, a puppy toy that's this big. <laughs> Oh yes, um, I've got some. <laughs> I've got some other toys around here somewhere. I can't reach them now because they're right at the other end. Oh, of the don't room. worry, don't worry. That was no. Um, I really like that description of how you managed to describe it for everyone. Because it's, I think, yeah. And play is so important, isn't it? It's really good for like bond building, relationship. Play is 
I think play is one of the fundamentals in dog training. Um, you know, a lot of people are all about using treats and treats and treats. But what I try and do is, is wean people off the treats and actually go on to using toys rather than treats. Um, because one, you're not always going to have treats with you, but you can always use something that you find, you know, even if you haven't got a specific toy with you, there's always something that you can find that you can use as a little toy. And I wouldn't suggest people use their leads though. Go on, give us some examples then. So I imagine people sort of went, well, I've always got the lead on me. Go on, explain well, what would you use the lead and give us some examples of what you might use to get a dog playing. If you'd like, oh my God, I've got my toy. I've not got any treats on me. What can I use? Okay, so simple things like if you've got a hanky, you could use a hanky. You could use, you know, you could take a sock off and use a sock. <laughs> Brilliant. You know, um, I'm one of these people who normally have has got a toy with me. Um, but if I were to forget a toy um, in the winter, I always have a woolly hat. Yeah. I use my woolly hat if I forgot <laughs> my toy because it just it just brings my dog back with me and you know especially if you've got a really good um what i would call an out so uh, you know getting your dog to give a toy back to you if you've got a really good one it doesn't really matter what what you're using um not you know, cause your dog to steal your hat when you're at home <laughs> no no it hasn't actually <laughs> no but but then i don't leave my hats lying around <laughs> yeah <laughs> I know people so, just be sat there going, well, surely my dog's going to start stealing my hat. So, so a bit of management in there. Don't leave your stuff lying around, guys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, you know, if you are having to improvise, then whatever you improvise with, you wouldn't just leave it lying around at home because, you know, even if I, you know, especially with, if you've got a puppy, um, if you've got a puppy, anything that you leave lying around is fair game. From <laughs> the puppy's point of view, it's all fair game. So. Um, so yeah so again in the winter gloves yeah you know there's always the environment as well what's out in the environment leaves grass yeah a grass um i wouldn't advise sticks um but you know th there's always something that you can that you can find that you can interact your you know get your pup's attention with even if it isn't to play a game of tug. And, and some people say to me, yeah, but my, my right. dog isn't my dog's interested. Just my dog's just barking, if you can hear them. The postman's yeah. arrived. She'll stop. Ah, yes, <laughs> yeah. Postman time, is it half 10? Must be. <laughs> yeah, must be about half 10. Yeah, it is, just about half 10. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so, you know, but, you know, the easiest solution, obviously, is just to keep a, a toy. Just, you know, even if it's one of these little roadkill toys, they're quite small to pop in your pocket. So if you just keep one in your walking, you know, if you've got a, a special um, jacket or something that you use for walking, just stick a toy in there. I mean, you'll always have one with you. Yeah, that's a really good idea then. Just to pop one in your dog. Everyone's got a dog walking jacket, haven't they? Yeah, <laughs> I've got several, so yeah. there's one in each. Yes, definitely. Just like, just like you put your poo bags in your pocket, put your toy in there as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and some, sometimes people say, oh, but my dog doesn't like playing with, with toys. Well, try it with an old tea towel. Yeah. Old tea towel, put a knot at the each end so it becomes almost like a little ropey thing. Um, and then see, and then play with it the way I showed you to play with, with the other toys. Um, and tea towels quite often work. Yeah, so there's something for people to have a try at home, for sure. Have a look what yeah. you've got around. You know, it doesn't have to be a specific dog toy it could be anything yeah i remember anything that. your anything that your dog likes to play with a pair of socks yeah. so it's all about learning to understand what your dog likes it is yes and a really good thing to do um you know to find out what your dog likes to play with is to sort of grab an awful load of you know different dog toys and just sit down with your dog and just try and wriggle them in front of them like i showed you before and see which ones they're interested in yeah okay yeah. and then start grading them grading them so my dog is really interested in this because it's got a ball on the end it's got fluff oh, it's really loves <laughs> it's lovely isn't it really love to play with that 
So if your puppy goes for that one every single time, you give it a 10. Okay, 10 means, oh, this is the best game ever. Okay, and then if you've got another toy, maybe just a simple tuggy, and your dog says, yeah, I quite like playing with that. But if this is in the play, then I want to play with that. Okay, but if it's the choice of that, yeah, I'll still play with that. That's a, probably a five. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, it's probably an eight. But if you then combine an eight with a five, <laughs> It then Brilliant. becomes a higher value toy. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, you know, I, I love toy play and I, I love using it as a reward for training, but also just as a way of building that bond between me and my dog. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, that, that's been really interesting to talk about how much you in, enjoy using play. Because I think I think play is massively important. And, probably not um, and I think play is so underestimated mm. as a training tool. It is just... Um, it's, it just boggles the mind because dogs like to play, right? Most yeah. dogs like to play. And if you've got a young puppy, then you can really use that, that playfulness that they have and direct it towards playing with you rather than playing on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is, that is the other thing that people do. So it's like, oh, but my puppy won't play. But what they mean is my puppy won't play on its own because they expect it to interact with the toys when they're just lying there and they're dead. And that's what they literally are, isn't it? <laughs> and that's what it is. You know, if something is just lying on the floor and it's not interesting in any way, shape, or form, why should your puppy want to play with it? Yeah. If you animate it, so if you make it move, then it becomes way more interesting to your puppy. And then it'll go like, oh, 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 that's nice. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, but now I'm going to pounce on it. And you'll see all these sort of behaviours from your puppy um, as they as they sort of learn to start to interact with these things. And I always, you know, when I've done litters, I've always done some element of toy play with the puppies when they're still in the litter. So I started out about six weeks. I wasn't, oh, this is interesting. So what sort of things do you do with the litter then when you, when you breed? Uh, so, so when I breed a litter, right, from about four weeks... I start putting in like a, a jungle gym. Okay, so basically what I did last time, um, yeah, and I don't have any photos or anything that I could send you of that. Um, but basically what I did was I, I put a rope from one side of the puppy pen to the other side of the puppy pen. And I just basically hooked toys off it that were just dangling. Oh. And it basically meant that the pups could then go to the toy and start tugging it and oh my god did they tug it they <laughs> tugged it so hard that they actually brought the pen in <laughs> so i had to then reconsider that one um so um so i that was probably up for about a week okay and then i started adding in my interaction with those toys so they'd already been exposed to those toys because toys like this they were just hanging down Right. And then pups could just grab them and start pulling them because that's what puppies want to do. They want to explore. So when they see something and it was all different textures as well. So yeah. there was some there were some bottles. Um, there were some balls. Um, there were soft toys like these. Um, there were like a bitey toys. So like a puppy rings, you know, the plastic puppy biting wow. rings, the teething yeah. rings, anything like that on there. And then I also had some cowbells. And oh my God, I think the cowbells, which were on just on a normal rope, and it's about five cowbells hanging down. And I just hung that on the side of the pen. And they were they, they were so popular that as soon as I put them in and they got over the initial fright of the bells, oh my God, they didn't stop ringing them. <laughs> that drove you nuts. <laughs> Oh, yes. It drove <laughs> us nuts. So in the end, they were just in there for a couple of hours a day. And then we had to take them up again because otherwise it just drove us. <laughs> it just drove us up the wall because there was always one of the puppies was always ringing those bells. Oh, wow. <laughs> Gosh, it sounds like so were... when the cow, when the cow bells, they were like, yeah, you know, that kind of size. So, you know, they were quite loud. So they must have been pretty loud, wasn't they? Oh, yes. Yeah. You could hear it outside if you stood outside. <laughs> I'm sure people, you know, when they were walking past our cottage, were thinking like, oh my God, what the hell is going on in there? 
<laughs> but so, so that I sort of started that from about four weeks of age and introducing those things. So every day I'd sort of introduce something different for the puppies to do. Um, so by the time they got to about five and a half, six weeks, I then started adding in a little bit of the play that I just um, I talked about, um, but really gentle, right? Because, you know, that, that tiny, tiny puppies, you can't just rip them from one side to the other. So it's a case of them biting onto a toy. It might just, me just grabbing the end of it and just, and just very gently putting a little bit of pressure on it. And then they learn to pull back a little bit and then let go, let them win it. And that's also a really important part on the play is to make sure that your puppy wins, right? 95% of the time, your puppy wins, not the other way around. Because if you do it the other way around, your puppy says, well, this is no fun. I never win. Yeah. It's and then nice they give up there. and they go off. So winning is part of building that bond with your puppy where he says, like, OK, I can play with you and I can win. And when I win, I will bring the toy back to you because I want to play again. If you don't let your puppy win, when he's got that toy, he'll be off with it and he won't come back. Play the keep away. Yeah, he will play keep away because he knows that as soon as you've got that toy again, you'll win again. So, you know, I always say, you know, 95% of the time, let your puppy win. 5% of the time, yeah, you might win. But let your puppy win the majority of the, of the games because otherwise it's just no fun. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're playing a board game with someone, right, and that person, or even a game of cards, and that person always wins. Do you want to play with that person? God, no. You can't do you? <laughs> exactly. Nice to win, isn't it? <laughs> it is just nice to win. It gives you that, that sort of, that, that spike in, 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 in um, was it dopamine? Serotonin? Dopamine, yeah. <laughs> dopamine, isn't it? Yeah. It gives you that spike in dopamine. It makes you feel good. So if you keep that, and if you make your puppy feel good around you all the time, then your puppy is much more likely to engage with you. And you're setting these puppies up for great success for building that connection when they go onto their new homes, doing all these different yeah. things with them, building up to have already have some play ready to go. Yes, yeah. And That's it's then right it's then it's then very sad when you do send them to a home and then they don't play with the puppy because the puppy has been actually primed to be that perfect companion. Um, and you know, I know not everybody will you know, will be doing it the same way as I do. Um, but, you know, for me, it is so important to get that puppy off to the absolute brilliant start that they need. Um, and for the people that the puppy goes to, to then, you know, continue on with that work. And when they do that, then the resulting puppy that they get is so much more than what they have actually ever wanted. Um, and, you know, and, you know, it's also, you know, a lot of time and effort goes into it from my point, you know, from my part when I'm when I'm raising a litter, because I just want to make sure that those pups, you know, one, that they go to the right people. So, you know, so don't be surprised if you found a really good breeder, right, that they will ask you tons and tons and tons and tons of questions about you about your circumstances about what you want from your puppy about what you expect to do with your puppy how you're going to raise that puppy all those questions they're all questions that I ask and I think it's about 50 odd questions that I ask prospective buyers yeah just to make sure that those puppies go to the right homes and then when I say okay you can have one of my puppies I match the puppy to the owner as well. Yeah. Um, I don't actually let uh, puppy owners, uh, puppy potential puppy buyers pick the puppy because I've spent all that time, you know, I've spent eight weeks with these puppies and sometimes even longer, but I've spent eight weeks with this puppy, with these puppies. And I know their personalities in and out, right? And I can tell, once I've met you a few times, I can tell what puppy would be best for you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of, you know, puppy own puppy buyers want to pick their own puppies Ooh, to be just... led by the... We froze for a sec there, but we're back. We're all right. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so where were we? Um, so you so yeah so sometimes it, it, it's much better for the breed to let the breeder pick your puppy for you because you might look at a puppy and think oh that puppy is really really cute but if that puppy is the you know if you're a first-time puppy owner and you're just looking for the cutest puppy in the litter that puppy might be completely unsuitable to what you want to do with that puppy so if you want to just have a, a pet dog that is quite happily happy to laze about all day. You don't want the puppy that is racing around the puppy pen going absolutely mad, <laughs> however cute she looks, all right? Because that's <laughs> not going to be the right match. No. And that's really interesting how you match them up as well. And it, yeah, it happens quite a lot, doesn't it? And you yeah. should be. Yeah. And I, I think, I think, I think that if I go to a breeder, right? Um, and I know my situation is a little bit different because obviously I'm a, I'm a dog trainer. I'm, I'm a very experienced breeder myself. I'm an experienced uh, person when it comes to dogs. OK, so I can do certain things with a puppy when I go and see a litter and say, OK, yeah, that puppy is OK for me. That puppy isn't. So I can make those decisions. Right. Because I can tell in quite a short space of time, say 20 minutes, what each puppy's personality is going to be like right but that experience has taught me how to how to suss that out whereas a normal puppy owner right they haven't got that knowledge behind them they haven't got that experience so they can't make those choices so if i have if i go to a breeder and if i were an inexperienced dog owner if i go to a breeder and they say oh i'll just just pick whichever one you want you know I would be a little bit like, okay, but what are the personalities like? You know, which puppy is going to fit best with me? If you ask those questions and that breeder can't answer your questions and can't steer you towards a specific puppy, then I would say walk away. Yeah. Definitely. Because it's you not worth it's right not right. worth you ending up with the wrong puppy. No, no. You've got these dogs for a long time. Hopefully. You've, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, the average age of a dog is what? 12 to 15, 16 years? Yeah, a few. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from your uh, larger breeders, they're a bit shorter, but yeah. So you've got that yeah. dog for a long time. You know, so it, it is a big commitment to get a dog. Yeah, massive commitment, massive commitment. I massive, think it's massive. often. Um, I think people have bought them too too quickly sometimes. People do, and they go, oh, I didn't quite, this isn't quite what I expected. Yes, and you get that a lot. You get that an awful lot where people say, oh, actually, that wasn't what I expected. I thought I was going to get X, Y, Z, and instead I have got uh, PQY. <laughs> definitely, definitely. You know, so, you know, it, it is, it's, your breeder should be knowledgeable enough to be able to point you towards the puppies that would suit your circumstances and what you want for that puppy the best. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So is anyone listening or to this that's thinking about getting a puppy, start writing questions down. What questions to ask your breeder? And be expected yeah. to be quizzed. And if you're not quizzed, like you said, Natasha, walk away. Walk away. If they're, if they're not quizzing you back, walk away. Because they should be as committed to placing the right puppy with you as you are to find that perfect puppy for you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right, God, we've talked about puppies a lot today, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, you've got a, you actually have a couple of books for puppies, don't you? So you've got yes. one about a dis, the distracted puppy, how to keep, I presume it's going to be about engagement. Um, yes, yeah, there's a, actually, there's a lot of engagement in that, but also some really some really nice little tips on how to you know how to get the most out of your puppy while you're on a walk so Ooh, for instance this with our viewers definitely yeah so for instance you know if you've struggled with getting your puppy back um when you're out on a walk so it's not just about lead walking that little book it's about just the dog walk in general right so if your puppy is really struggling and pulling on the lead because she wants to go and see what that leaf is fluttering about over there or oh there's some noise in the undergrowth <gasps> i wonder what that is you know puppies are inquisitive right they want to explore when your puppy is in that mode there is no point in asking your puppy to walk on a nice little street right because they're just not going to do they're not going to be able to do it so 
when you are doing that, so basically what I do is I use a, a two point system when I do the loose leaf walking, right? If I clip the lead on the back of the harness, because I use harnesses for puppies because I don't like having restrictions on the neck because the necks are so easily damaged, um, you know? So I like to keep my necks, my puppies necks free from any pressure. So I, I, I use little harnesses. So when you use a little harness, I just happen to have one here. <laughs> okay. So you've got a harness. If you've got a harness with a, 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 a ring on the back Explain and a ring on the harness front. that is for people. Cause so, okay. So, so we, the, we best, the best to harness them. to get is a Y shaped harness. And what we mean when we say Y shaped is that this top here, look, it looks like a Y, doesn't it? It looks like a Y and basically the dog's head goes through that bit and then this bit here goes underneath the uh, in between the front legs and then round the barrel um, at the, uh, and then meets up with with the top bits here. Right, I haven't got Jack here so I can't show you on Jack. Don't worry. Jack is my stuffy. <laughs> <laughs> okay but when I walk my dogs right when I'm, when my dog is distracted, I will always use the back ring, right? If I want my dog to walk on a really nice loose lead, I use the front ring. If I've only got a, a normal lead with, um, just with one clip on, I will just change from the back to the front. Yeah. Right. And then once it's clipped on the front, I'm actually actively teaching my puppy to stay by my side. OK, so I don't let her wander off and then try and get her back. I will actually keep rewarding her for staying by my side. So it's always worth grabbing extra treats and keeping them in your pocket so that once your puppy is walking nicely next to you, you can reward it. If it wanders off, you just stop, use a tree to get the puppy back into position and then feed her for, for being in that position. And whenever she's in the right position, I always use three treats to reward that position before I start moving again. Go on, why do you use three treats? The reason I use three treats is because the more rewards I give my puppy for being in the right position, the more likely she is to stay there. Absolutely. And um, so that's the reason why I do the, the three treating. Yeah. Okay, so if my puppy is in, I wanna explore everything that I see, I just clip it on the back and just let her do whatever she wants to do. On the back, she can pull. Yeah. She can drag me from place to place. I don't care. But as soon as I engage that front clip, that front ring, that means, okay, we're going to do some serious work now. Yeah, nice and clear to the puppies. And it's, it becomes really nice and clear. And if you've got a, um, a, a double-ended lead, so a proper training lead, which has got the two clips, one at the front uh, on either end of the lead, you know, when in exploring mode, you just use the back one. But then when you want to go to loose lead walking, you just clip the other end of the lead onto the front. Yeah. So you then then actually when you when you do that, you actually get your puppy much better in balance than if you just use the front. But I know some people don't want to do the, you know, complicated training leads because they've got two clips. And what the hell do I do with them? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's how I normally teach my loose lead walking anyway um, to yeah. my students. Um, so that when your puppy's really distracted, just clip it on the back. Uh, when you want to, when you need to make sure that your puppy is by your side and not dragging you all over the place. You know, for instance, if you're walking along a busy road, that's then the place where I would be concentrating on keeping my puppy by my side because wandering, puppy wandering there can potentially be dangerous, right? So you want to keep your puppy by your side. And, you know, you might not get very far very quickly, but if you're just consistent and say, actually, no, I want you, you know, when you're like this, I want you by my side, you'll be amazed at how quickly your puppy learns that once either the front or both are engaged, this is when I need to be by mum's side. And before you know it, you'll have a puppy that walks on a nice loose lead all the time. Now, on the other side is that if you've got a puppy that is distracted when it's off the lead, you know, use the play to keep your puppy with you. And a really simple tip is that 
when you take the lead off, first thing you do, rather than just let the puppy go and run away from you, if you, the moment you unclip that lead, engage your puppy in play, they're much more likely to stick with you for the rest of the walk. Brilliant. And then every now and again, when your puppy comes back, you just play again. Brilliant. They, will, they won't wander quite as far if you do that than when you just let them go. Yeah. It's just, again, getting that engagement, getting that engagement, getting that engagement early on as well when they're super young, which doesn't mean you can't do it when they get older. No, no, you, you can, you can, you know, uh, you know, I teach this technique to adult class as well as my puppy classes, um, especially the, you know, let your puppy off the, you know, let your dog off the lead. Sorry, I've got an itchy eye. Um, if you let your puppy off the lead, or your adult dog off the lead and it's got this habit of as soon as the lead comes off it's already straining to get away from you you know show them a toy take them off the lead start playing with that toy so the moment the lead comes off you start playing your pup is going to your pup or your adult dog is going to stay with you because hey you're fun i want to hang around you you're fun you're cool <laughs> That's such a great tip to just get that engagement straight away as yeah, soon as yeah. you're you know you, you don't wait until your dog until your dog is um distracted before you try and get that engagement once the dog is distracted it's too late yeah you need to get that that focus on you and that engagement with your dog before your dog decides to bugger off definitely definitely <laughs> I, I, I say I, politely <laughs> <laughs> And they do, and they do. And quite often you see people at the park, don't you, with their like hands out here trying to let the dogs off the lead because the dogs are desperate to get off and go. Yeah, yeah, and actually, the, 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 and, it's, and then releasing them is the greatest reward you could give them for pulling. Yeah. There you go. You've got so many questions for you. We're not going to get through all of them. Um, but you do have a book all about pulling, don't you? Yes. Called no Pulling Allowed. No Pulling Allowed is my book about... Um, it's... That book is aimed at people who have already got a problem with pulling, right? Um, so if you've got a dog that pulls, then having a look at my No Pulling Allowed book will give you five basic exercises that you can do with your dog that will reduce the pulling, but it won't reduce them overnight, right? Because training takes time. If your dog has a history of pulling for five years, reading my book, and trying it for a week is not going to solve the issue, right? If you're consistently doing the things, the exercises that I'm showing you in that um, book, and one of the exercises is actually how to get your dog used to a harness, okay? Because even if you walk your, your dog on a harness, quite often your dog isn't completely confident having that harness put on. And that already then puts them in this mindset of, I'm not comfortable here, which then will make them pull even more, <clears throat> right? So if you get them completely comfortable with the process of putting the harness onto your dog, um, then your puppy and, and your, your puppy, your, your adult dog, your puppy, whatever it is that you've got, is going to feel much better and much more confident right from the start of the walk. Brilliant. Okay. Um, another thing is if your puppy gets overexcited before the walk, you know, bring that excitement down before you step out of the front door. Because if your dog is overexcited and you step out of the front door, your dog is much more likely to pull, right? Because they're excited, they're going to pull. So if you can calm them down and then go out, they'll be less likely to pull because they'll be calmer. And these are like the foundations that you need to be getting in there with your dogs. And <clears throat> yeah. What's so easy is miss. The people are just, you know, you get, you get, oh, no, how do you leave the house? Oh, I just get dragged out the front door. Yeah, and it, it just sets the whole walk up for frustration and anxiety and um, disappointment because your dog has dragged you around that whole walk once again, you know. Frustration, frustration. It's, it, it's very frustrating. It is very frustrating when you've got a dog that does nothing but pull you. Yeah, and it's if, really if you've got a bigger dog, um, it hurts. It hurts oh too. yeah yeah uh, you know shoulder pain I, uh, you know just a little story uh, of something that happened to me um i used to look after um a greyhound um 
I, I used to run a, a daycare and, and dog walking business as well as doing the dog training. I haven't got time to do that anymore. So it's just dog training now. <laughs> but um, basically one of the, the dogs that came to me on a regular basis, they were with me two, three days a week. And it was always um, the way I was running my business was it was always dogs from one household. Um, so I never had many, many, many dogs from different households together because I, I just didn't think that was right. Um, so basically what happened was that the dog, the weekend before he came to me that week, um, had had a little accident and cut his leg, well, her leg. And she had staples in it, so she wasn't allowed to run off lead. Right. So I was walking her on her lead um, with her um, her companion, which was a, a male whippet. So the male whippet was off lead and he was doing his zoomies around the field, having great fun. And, you know, I knew I could just could let him go because he would come back every single time you call him. So there was no issue with him just going off and, and just, you know, going to find the bunnies and, and trying to find where they were. But he'd never leave the field or ever, never, ever go out of my field of sight. So, you know, it wasn't an issue. And as soon as I call him, we'd be back anyway. So I was walking her on her lead because obviously I couldn't let her off because of the, the, the leg wound. And we came across a lady with a border collie and she was throwing a ball for the border collie, which was all very well, apart from the fact that Sylvie, the greyhound, was absolutely obsessed with balls. So as soon as I saw her coming into the field and I was about halfway down and she was coming towards me with the ball. Um, I sort of shouted at her saying, you know, could you please not throw the ball because she's got an injury and she needs to be on the lead. Um, so that was all well and good. And the lady came up to me and we had a little chat and I said, oh, th thank you very much for not throwing the ball for your dog, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, explain the whole situation kind of thing. Um, and she said, oh, no, 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 not a problem. So she walks past me. She's not five meters past me that she started chucking that ball again. Guess what happened? Sylvie spotted the ball and basically went from standstill to about 200 miles an hour in three paces. Took my arm with it. Ouch. So she hit the end of the lead. My arm came out of its socket and then sprung back in. Ooh. But it was very, very painful. I imagine very, very painful. Really and painful. I, very, very painful. I was lucky that he went back in. Yeah. But it, everything was stretched. So it was basically like a dislocated shoulder. It's making me cringe just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. But this is the kind of thing that happens. Um, you know, and you know, no matter how careful you are, you are also re reliant on other people doing the right thing especially in situations like that yeah. um so actually i was out of out of action for about three months with that my goodness my goodness to get it to heal properly mm. and had to have physio and all sorts just to get it all to come back but yeah yeah it was, it was very very painful and it's, it, it was sound very, as well <laughs> just sounds very painful bless you it was it yeah, was very it's, painful it's just so important to get you know getting like at your book that's brilliant to get them walking by your side yeah and it's it's you know it's got like little um the little exercises are how to get your dog to, to come next to you and stay there and then do the three treats thing and then you know what i would done though is throw another treat out to get the dog to go out again when you're practicing but you know when you're out on a walk and your dog goes ahead of you right you stop you do that exercise to get them back to your side it's no good just doing it in your garden and getting your dog to do it in the garden and then not practice when you're out and about yeah okay so you know when you do follow those tips that are in my book um you will get a really good understanding of you know of the individual elements because what i like to do is when i look at dog walking right i don't look at walking on a nice loose lead as a whole right i look at it as saying okay which elements does that break down into and then i teach those elements separately and in the end put it all together and that's what i've tried to do in the book as well which is why you know you've got the 
the different exercises um and they are you know in the book right at the end of the book they are explained step by step exactly Brilliant. how to get you know how to do it um and then also as a bonus with the book there's also a short video series as well oh fab fab so yeah people must, must grab hold of that if they want some help with loose lead walking for sure yeah yeah so yeah so that's that's that book and then at the moment i am writing i'm in the process of writing a um a puppy version yeah of the book um which basically what i do in that book is basically take you through the process that i use to teach my dogs to walk on a nice loose lead from the moment they come home okay so from i started at eight weeks old so when i get my puppy at eight weeks i actually start doing exercises with them that will help me reach my goal of teaching them to walk on a nice loose lead right from the word go oh fabulous i wish so, we had more time to talk about all these different things that you're doing sasha honestly yeah. if we had all i could sit here all day and talk to you uh, i'm not even we have even touched on the positive belgian site that you've set up because you no, mentioned no. it very early on you're talking about how um it's often it's often thought that you need to use hard, harsh handling with them. Um, yeah, when actually yeah. you, you said they're set, they're all that, and think they were difficult, but actually they're quite a sensitive breed. And no, they're, they're difficult because they're such a sensitive breed. And I think that is where the misunderstanding is. They, people think of Belgian Shepherds as hard dogs because they're used by the military, because they're used by the police. They think like, you know, they are these really um, butch, cool dudes of dogs right that go and apprehend bad guys right yeah. <laughs> you know if you have ever seen the video that the belgian police put out oh gosh it must have been about 15 years ago where you have a mally just basically on an exercise going over the top of a car to go and apprehend a criminal it is bloody amazing and it gives the impression that these dogs are really hard biters, that they are hard in character. Um, and they're not at all. They are the most sensitive souls you'll ever come across in the dog world, right? They are uber sensitive and they form really strong bonds with one person, right? But because they have this reputation of being a badass dog, because of the work that they do, people think that you cannot train them using reward-based training methods or play training methods. Yeah. And they are so trainable when you use the right method to teach them, right? Um, Give us, For instance, um, yeah, so give us a couple of examples of some of the like, foundation stuff maybe you'd do with them. So it would so, be the play you talked about earlier. Yeah, so you use the play that I talked about earlier. Um, you use, uh, basically, you really spend a lot of time to get focus on you, okay, with a Belgian. You want them to focus on you. You don't want them focused outwards unless you want them to focus outwards. Um, because they are a guarding breed, right? So if you if you encourage that guarding behavior, you are going to get a dog that is constantly on edge, constantly wanting to, you know, survey the environment. Where is the threat coming from next? OK, and you don't actually want them to think about where's the threat coming from next. You want them to think like everything is OK. Oh, there's something wrong there. Okay, that's the kind of guarding that you want. You know, you want them to recognize danger when it's there, but you don't want them to be on edge all the time. Yeah. And that is, I think that is where a lot of people go wrong is that they don't understand that about how to, how to train a, a guarding breed, right? Because you don't actually need to train it. They go and train the guarding um side of the belgian shepherd rather than just leaving it alone because that dog has got this innate instinct to guard when it's needed but if we if we let them 
especially as puppies, if we let them obsess about guarding, then they become really difficult to handle because they're always on alert, which is why you need to teach them that focus on you. But they will still be in the back of their minds, they'll be thinking like, is there any danger? Is there any danger? Is there any danger? And that's really that's really difficult. You know, when you when you don't understand that bit about the breed. You you get that, you know, you get that misconception that these dogs are, are really hard, hard ass. And then people start using aversives like prong collars, like e collars. Explain what they are in case people don't know what they are. Okay, so a prong collar is basically a metal um, collar that tightens on the dog's neck. And they have, they have like these two prongs on each link. There's like two prongs sticking out um, like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Can you see that on the camera? I know what it is. Like, like, but like that. Head, yeah. yeah, like that. So the, each link has got like these two prongs like that. And they, this, these links sort of like linked together. And what happens is that when it goes around the dog's neck and if it's then used to correct the dog, so a sharp tuck is given on that, do those pins actually just come closer together and they basically just pinch the skin in between those two prongs. So those, those two prongs and those two prongs, which of course is discomfort and it can cause pain especially if it's done incorrectly. And most people who use these collars don't know how to use them correctly, not to cause that pain. Also, if they are not on the right part of the neck, they don't work. So there is a lot of things that people need to know about these collars before you can actually use them correctly. And e-collars are basically um, electronic collars that um, give some sort of a current through the collar but which then goes into shock isn't it it's like an electric shock yeah i was trying to put it a little bit politer than that but it basically whenever the, the the owner then you know pushes the button if the dog is misbehaving for instance they push the button and then the dog gets a shock which is then supposed to stop that behavior from happening the problem with those collars is that while it can correct the behavior while it's going on it doesn't actually tell the dog what to do instead. So it's like telling your dog no and then not giving them any further information. And as okay. humans, if you told me no, I'd go, well, what do you want me to do instead? Yeah, I'm and this is that. and this is what we need to tell our dogs. So if we say to our dogs, no, you can't do that, we need to tell them what they have to do instead. Because if we don't, your dog is gonna make a different choice and it's probably going to be just as inappropriate as the choices was making what you actually um, corrected them for. Um, so, and because Belgian shepherds are so incredibly sensitive, you can either get, you know, if you use this too often, you can either get one of two reactions. One, the Belgian is just gonna com completely shut down and not respond to anything anymore. Or it's going to turn around and bite you on the arse. One of those two. If you know how to use it correctly, then it's slightly different. But like I said, most people don't. Yeah. And, it's and, and the general public don't, don't know how to use it. You know, those, those people who, um, who train um, these dogs for the military who train these dogs as protection dogs they probably have got a better understanding how to use those tools but then you know when you for instance when you see them on um on facebook on facebook groups um within the belgian shepherd community you know if someone talks about their dog pulling on the lead the first thing, and I can guarantee that one of the first answers will be pop a, shock, pop, pop a prong collar on that dog and correct it every time it starts pulling. Which is and there are so much better ways of doing it because if you do that to the wrong Belgian, he's, he's going to have you. And which is why you've created your Positive Belgian website, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. Yeah. So my aim with that website is to give people an alternative, a positive alternative on how to train their Belgian shepherds. You know, and I've been training Belgian shepherds and I've been owning and breeding Belgian shepherds for over 17 years. So I've got a lot of experience um, with the breed. And, you know, and I have never, ever had to use any of these methods to get my dogs to do what I need them to do. Um, and, you know, even with Cassie, who is my, I called her my problem child before because she is dog reactive, right? And she became dog reactive because she was attacked by some of the dogs, okay, at a very impressionable young age. And unfortunately with Belgian shepherds, is they don't seem to forget. They don't seem to forget. They know exactly what type of dog it was that did that to them. And the more negative experiences they are, the, they escalate their own behavior, right? So she's an awful lot better than she was now. Um, and I can, I can take her for a walk on her own and I can walk her around loads and loads and loads of dogs and she will not react at all now. Wow. But it's taken a long, long time. I only let her off lead if I know there's nobody else about because I know that if she's off lead and a particular breed of dog comes over the ridge of a hill or something if it is one of the breeds of dogs that actually went for her she will be over there and she'll be pinning it to the floor and because she got such a an extreme reaction to that i tend to err on the side of caution and keep her on the lead most yeah. of the time so probably about 80 percent of the walks that i do with her now are on lead walks that doesn't mean that she doesn't get any off lead time at all because she does because there are fields that we go in that i know are i can see exactly when someone comes into the into the fields and as long as it's a certain distance away i know i can get her back um, so, you know, it has improved, but if someone were to shoot up her in, on her right in front of her, then I can't guarantee that she's not going to go in and, and go for that dog. Yeah. But it does take time, just, especially reactivity. I've had a reactive dog. It just takes time. It takes a lot. It, it does take a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And actually, if we can avoid that from happening. Yes. So going then, back to what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. So if, if we can avoid that from happening by having that engagement from your dog from right from the word go um then you know unless something really unfortunately happens like what happened with cassie where the dog actually came onto us and she was on the lead so she was restricted in what she could do yeah. to defend herself um and like i said and it was a very impressionable age as well because she was 18 months old which is the most terrible time for it to happen to a belgian um because they they go I don't I haven't seen this in any other breed but the Belgians seem to go through like a sensitive period again about 18 months yeah and um because the way Belgians are if something negative happens within that time frame you know it, it does cause quite a lot of issues it can cause an, an awful lot of issues and that's what happened with 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 Cassie but yeah, if we're getting this right, like we said, getting this right from the start, like we've talked about today, getting the engagement and stuff. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Well, I had that, but yeah. unfortunately, you know, we had... Yeah, and the thing really is, you cannot control other people, right? You know, um, because, you know, soon after that initial incident happened, we were I was down at the river playing with them in the river, throwing balls for them, and all of a sudden, this collie came and just went for her. Oh, God bless her. So two incidents, not even just one. No, 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 it was two incidents, which I think is why her reaction has now got so, um, so strong. Yeah, yeah, so strong just because, you know, she thought she was safe playing in the in the river. I thought we were safe where we were, you know. I hadn't seen that dog there before. I haven't seen it since, but it just basically came in, went for her, and then after it finished with her, it went for her mum as well. Oh, God bless you. Bless you. So he didn't just go for one of my dogs. He went for two. Oh, God. Um, so that was very unfortunate. But, you know, you can't you can't control other people's dogs. No. 
No, we really can't, um, unfortunately. But we can, but, con- can we can control and look after our dogs, can't we? Yes, we That's can. Our ability. We can, yeah. So go on, I'm going to finish it up with then. I'd love to know your top three tips for engagement. How to get engagement and connection with, with your dogs, whether it's your dogs you're doing or maybe you're helping a client. Okay, so with my own dogs, I think we talked about all the things that I do anyway with my dogs. So, you know, it's the play with my dogs. It's it's getting that focus from them when I need it. Um, but with a client's dogs, it's always a little bit different, isn't it? So to get a connection with a client's dogs, first of all, I think for my part, it's being calm and really patient. So when I go and meet a client's dog, right, I'm not going in there immediately fussing that dog because, you know, that dog's going to go, whoa, 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 I don't know you from Adam. Why are you doing that to me? So I always wait for the dog to come to me. Right. When the dog comes to me, that's then when I start to engage with the dog. So I talk to it and I don't, you know, even when I'm talking to it, I'm not looking at it directly because that can be really, really um, off-putting for a dog, right? Staring in its eye, actually, in doggy language, if you've got two dogs staring each other in the eye, it's really aggressive behavior, right? So don't stare a dog in their eyes. Unless you know that dog really well and the dog is really comfortable with you, you don't look it in the eye. Because it will pop the dog's defenses up. Um, And then what I next do is to try and get a little bit of an engagement between me and the dog. I might throw a few treats out. If that dog is is ready and happy to go and get those treats from the floor and then come back to me, I might then offer it a treat from my hand just to see how that dog is reacting to my presence. Yeah. Um, And once I've done that, then after a little while, I might ask it to do a couple of behaviors like a sit or a down and see how it reacts to that and then feed it. And then after that, I'll probably get a little toy out and see if I can engage it in a little bit of play. You can get back to play again. Get back to play again because play is, is, is. you know, because it is so important to get that that connection with the dog. And and sometimes, you know, you get you get to a dog, and you get to a client's house, and the dog doesn't actually know how to play. And then what they can do is start how you showed earlier on. Yeah, yeah, and that, that. that's basically what I then do is that I then start with that kind of thing, what I was showing earlier on, doing that kind of thing. So I sort of I get a few toys out, or I ask the owners to get a few toys out and, and just see if if I animate those toys, is there any interest? Yeah. Is there any interest in that toy? No, no interest in that one. We'll try this one. And we keep going until we find something that a dog is interested in. Sometimes it's a tea towel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just a really, really long tuggy. Yeah. But it just depends on what the dog likes. Yeah. And learning about what your dog's like is so, so important. It is, yeah. Yeah. And, it, and you know, I, what I said before about, you know, trying to find out what your dog likes, you know, which toys your dog likes. You can do exactly the same thing with treats, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, because sometimes people come up to me and they say, oh, actually my dog doesn't like treats and then what they've got is like gravy bones <laughs> you know the most boring treat you could ever have <laughs> but actually even if you've got food you can make it into a game yeah going back into play again <laughs> you're going back into play again you know even you know like i said before like with the throwing a little treat out yeah that's already starting play with the dog yes you're using food but it doesn't matter and sometimes just having food in your hand and just making your hand go and then just dropping a treat every now and again. Yeah. To get that engagement, to get that connection between you and the dog. You know, there's lots of ways that you can that you can connect with a dog. And it doesn't, you know, Labrador's typically want food, right? But there's not, you can still play with food. It doesn't have to be a toy. And then you once share. you've got them playing with food, then it's actually quite easy to transfer that food play to toy play. Okay, brilliant. You know, because if you use something like a, a lotus ball, which is or a clam, which is basically a ball 
with Velcro on it and you put treats inside and then you just close it up. Yeah. And then you can roll that. And then basically what you first, the first thing that you do is actually you teach the dog how to open it. But once the dog has figured out how to open that toy himself to get at the food that's in it, you can then start rolling it on the floor. You don't throw it miles. You just roll <laughs> it on the floor, get a little bit of movement in there. Yeah. The dog will pounce on it, open it up, get the food out. So you can put a little bit more. Then the next thing you do is you have one of these clams and you add a little bit of a string to it. Yeah. So you can then start getting to something like this. Brilliant. But then you have the the, the ball on the, you know, the, the food yeah. ball on the end of it. So the food is in there and you've got a little bit of a longer stretch to it. So you can then start Good. adding in that play and building that play to what I showed you before. Brilliant, brilliant. Oh, thank you. You've shared so many ideas today. People have been <laughs> going away going, I don't know which one to start. First, we have to watch. Yeah, that's going to write them down. <laughs> down. Wait, if we'll write it down. I'll maybe I'll have to put a note, make sure people have got notepads to write some notes down for this one. Yeah. So thank you for so much today. It's been really interesting. Um, what I want to know, though, is how can people find out more about you and where can they go look? For example, we talked about your books and stuff. We share your websites and everything with us. Yeah, OK. So my um, my normal website, so the one for my dog training site, um, is um, funfocusplate.com. So that's nice and easy. Nice and easy. It used to be nice, say, nightsaber.training.co.uk, but it was so long. I thought I'm just because I'm having because I've got my fun focus play program and my fun focus play, the, you know, as the philosophy the system that I use, I thought it just makes sense making that the website. So wow. that's what I've done. So it's funfocusplay.com. Um, so that's just the, the general training site. And then the site specifically for the Belgian Shepherd is um, thepositivebelgian.com. Brilliant, brilliant. So that's nice. that's the best place to, to find me. Um, my book can be bought um, either direct from my Fun Focus Play website or people can get a copy of Amazon. Fabulous, fabulous. And my new book, once it's out, the one, the, the one with the from the puppies, that will go um, on both of those websites as well. well so that, it'll that be, be able to share. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you know, um, like I said to you before, we're actually in the middle of a move, so yeah. um, so it just depends on how that goes. But hopefully, I'll be able to to finish it off and get it out for Christmas. No, that's so the plan. Out Christmas, Christmas presents, guys. Yes, Christmas. that's the plan anyway. So the plan is to bring it out by the end of November. Brilliant, brilliant. So keep um, your eyes yeah, on Yeah, yeah. We need to um I need to redo a couple of chapters um because I'm not happy with them. And but um once that's done, it can go to the editor and, and all the other bits and pieces can be done. Um, oh, and then wow. and then hopefully we'll be able to release it towards the end of November. Super exciting. So people have to keep an eye out for that when that's released. Cool. Yes. So thanks again for today. You know where you can find out more about Attention Ads. We've just shared it with you. And um, have a super day, guys. And thanks for coming. Well, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. We'll see you soon.